So this is my um, title, what do we need to know? This is a very vague title, so we need to narrow it down a bit. And I think the first thing to do is to focus on the what. So the what do we need to know? Um, so focusing on the what, we've got what things do we need to know? So what knowledge is there out there uh, that we maybe uh, could know? Well, this whole enterprise of trying to work out what knowledge there is out there uh, began in the 18th century and in France, where they started in the 1750s to put together this thing called the encyclopedia. Now, we're quite familiar with encyclopedias now, but this was the first one. And the title encyclopedia means an all round education. Now, this <laughs> was a huge book and it ran to so many volumes. Uh, enormously expensive. Um, now, where do you start? Well, they gave us some clues about where to start in this encyclopedia because they tried to break the knowledge down and they did this in various ways, but this one's quite an interesting one. This is a tree of all the knowledge in the world and each leaf is a different subject and the branches show how the knowledge um, leaves relate uh, to each other. Now, can we learn the whole tree? Can we have an encyclopedic knowledge? Um, perhaps look at just uh, one leaf. So I don't know much about painting, so I thought we'll have a look at the leaf of paintings and ask what things do we need to know uh, about paintings? So I had a look around uh, uh, and uh, tried to find out places where people say, okay, this is what you need to know about paintings. And I found one uh, on the internet, an essay, the 30 paintings that everybody needs to know. Now, this is one of them. Now, um, that to me is a painting that I sort of know, but in this particular essay, uh, they wanted the artist and the title. And I don't know either of those. It's, it's familiar, but I don't know who painted it or what it's called. And then another one, again, it's sort of familiar. And maybe if I looked at that for a long time, I could have come up with the artist, which is uh, Kandis Kandinsky. But I think even if I had have known the title, I wouldn't have remembered it because it's called Composition 8. Now, actually, there's only one painting out of the 30 where I could have told you the title and the uh, artist, and that's this one. This is Picasso's Guernica. And I know this painting because I'm interested in the Spanish Civil War, um, which is what the painting is about. So this painting I know about, not because I know anything about painting, which clearly I don't, but it's, I know about this particular painting because it's relevant to something else that I'm interested in. Now, I noticed in this list of 30 paintings that there's no paintings from Africa or Asia or Australia and I thought, well, maybe there's an idea behind what we need to know that's somehow local. So I thought, what can we think about that's local that we might need to know? So for me, I'm born and, born and bred in Britain. I thought I could ask, what things do we Brits uh, need to know? And actually, there's an official answer to this because there's a government test that you can take if you want British citizenship. And um, although you have to pay £50 to look at the official government test, there's lots of websites been set up where they've found out the questions. And uh, if you want to apply for citizenship, you can go and try, try yourself out on the questions for free. So I've had a look at some of these. Um, and here's some example questions. So um, how many members of the Northern Ireland Assembly are there? Now, apparently all Brits should know this. Well, I didn't, um, there's 108. What kind of event is the Grand National? Well, I did know that one, uh, that's a horse race. When were the first coins made in England? Well, the answer to that, I thought it was the Bronze Age, but it actually was the Iron Age. And then I got annoyed about that because there was no place called England in the Iron Age. England came along a lot later. So if I'd have set that question in the university, I'd, I'd have been asked to change it because it's not a very good question. The last one I'm now a bit embarrassed by because I'm so sure that the answer to where was King Henry VIII's wife Anne Boleyn executed is Tower Hill that I forgot to check it. So I hope it's um, uh, 
that she was uh, executed at the tower. Otherwise, I, I'll be quite embarrassed. So I've done this quiz a few times now and routinely out of 24, I get 19 right. And the pass mark is 18. So I've lived in the UK all my life and I'm scoring 19 out of 24 on the test about life in the UK. And for somebody recently arrived, you have to score 18. If you look across these kinds of questions, we see um, recurring themes. So there's lots in it about kings and queens. There's also a lot in it about um, uh, the organisation of our government at um, uh, union level, national level, local level. And then there's a lot on how we manage to be both a, a democracy and a monarchy at the same time. There's a lot of questions about the national symbols of the various parts of the UK. I've chosen the daffodil here. St Andrew crops up a lot because he's not only symbolic for uh, Scotland, but he's also a date in the Anglican church calendar. And my golfers here represent sports, but the selection of sport is quite interesting in this quiz. It's very important that you know about golf, um, horse racing and rowing, but I couldn't see any questions at all about football. Now, this test has been uh, quite roundly criticised and in fact in 2018 uh, there was a review uh, in the House of Lords and the House of Lords concluded that this test was a test of random trivia and they also decided that it was actually a barrier to acquiring citizenship they felt it was designed to keep people out basically and this is one of the hazards if you prescribe what knowledge people should know because the people who don't know what happens to them. So prescribing what people should know is a way of dividing one group of people uh, from another. And this is an ongoing issue in Parliament. It was due for discussion just before Christmas, but uh, it's been put off for, um, you know, other things have cropped up. Now, my area is science, so I was interested to see if life in the UK uh, has any science questions. There are a few. And I would say that they recommend the kind of great men of science approach, as we call it in my field. So we've got Tim Berners-Lee there, the inventor of the World Wide Web, and we've got Isaac Newton, who first characterised gravity. We've also got some great British inventions. You can see penicillin there, and also the hovercraft. Now, I remember being very excited about the hovercraft when it was um, first introduced, but I gather that nowadays uh, you'll only see one if you need to be rescued from a swamp. Now, this uh, difference between the kinds of common questions um, about history and religion and the rarer questions about science reminded me um, of a debate that uh, has flared up every now and then in our uh, in our society and an important episode in the late 50s became known as the two cultures debate and this was prompted by uh, a series of articles um, and broadcasts by C.P. Snow. Now Snow trained as a scientist and then he became a civil servant and also a novelist so he mixed in quite a wide range of circles and he felt that the intellectual life of the whole of Western society is increasingly being split into two polar groups. And those groups, he felt, were people who know about science and people who don't know about science. And the problem uh, Snow could see in this was that the people who don't know about science are the ones who are in charge. Now, this was a, 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 an interesting time. Uh, for science, the late 50s, we're trying to work out what to do with hydrogen bombs. Uh, the first uh, satellite is about to go up. Uh, there's our first uh, civil nuclear accident in train at Windscale. So Snow was concerned that there are a lot of people around who don't know about science, and they're the ones who are making the decisions about these uh, science-based problems. A similar issue flared up again in the 1980s when scientific organisations were expressing concern 
that the public didn't know much about science. And they, they felt this wasn't good for science and it wasn't good for the public either. And there was some research done at the time. This is from 1989. This is um, a test uh, that was done as part of a survey about science. And you've got scientific statements on the left and you have to say whether they're true or false. And you can see the correct answers given in bold on the right. So the first one got a great deal of attention. I think, in fact, it was on the front page of the Sun newspaper. The Sun goes round the Earth. Uh, false said 66%, but 29% said that was true. So question uh, nine is quite an interesting one as well. Remember 1989, antibiotics kill viruses as well as bacteria. There, 43% uh, thought that was true. Now, I should imagine that in 2020, a rather a lot um, fewer think that's true. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in the present predicament. But at the time, that was a very controversial response because people with colds and flu were going to the doctor and asking for antibiotics. And sometimes the doctor would even give them antibiotics because they felt the patient went away feeling better if they'd got a, a prescription. But overall, um, the results from this quiz, and I should say this was part of a much bigger survey, but this was the bit that, that got attention at the time. Generally, the results were considered shocking. You know, we're, a, we're an educated nation, we're a scientific nation, and the public know hardly anything about science. Um, this uh, spawned uh, a little industry. Um, so, for example, we found books coming out like this, which came out in 1991, 1,001 Things Everyone Should Know About Science. So bear that in mind, there's 1,001 things that you need to know. And um, funnily enough, uh, this book is still in print. You can still buy it, looks like that now. Uh, so 20 years on. And um, people who are buying it now are reviewing it and saying, well, it's not very up to date. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, you know, 20, uh, 30 years old. And um, one thing we can say about science is that it does uh, change over time. Another interesting result from this uh, research was about whether knowledge gave you particular attitudes or behavior. And some of the motivation from the scientists involved in all of this activity was that if we can tell people the right things, then they'll have the right attitudes, they'll be very positive about science, um, they'll take scientific advice and they'll behave um, in a certain way. And um, unfortunately, this turned out um, not to be the case, because if you do give people a lot of scientific knowledge, then what happens is that their attitudes tend to spread over a range and their attitudes could be different. They could be very cross about GM food, but very happy with nuclear power, for example. Uh, and sometimes the more knowledge people have, the stronger their attitudes are. So they might be much more negative about science if they've got more knowledge or indeed more positive. Uh, so the connection is not straightforward. And similarly with behavior, it, it seems that you can't give people a particular piece of scientific information and then expect them to act uh, in a certain way. I think we're seeing a little bit of this during the relaxation of the COVID uh, lockdown because you know we look at people going out and and um, uh, giving each other a hug uh, uh, down the pub and uh, one reaction to that might be well don't they know <laughs> well chances are they do know but um, their choices about how they behave are not necessarily informed uh, by what they know about the science of covid so behavior also is not necessarily straightforwardly connected to what we know. So generally, this uh, research came to some um, quite useful conclusions. One is that people mostly uh, know quite a bit about science. Um, I mean, if you ask a set number of questions, you're going to divide the people who know from the people who don't. But if you ask people just in general what kind of things they know about, then they have quite a lot of ideas and knowledge. Importantly, what people know or actively learn is stuff that's relevant to them. And that may be relevant at this moment in time or relevant to their whole life. Um, but if, if a piece of information matters to someone, then they'll go out and learn it. If it doesn't matter to them, if it's not relevant, they're not gonna bother. 
Another important result is that the scientific version of how things work may not be the most important to some people. So somebody could be perfectly clear about how, for example, a nuclear power station works, but they may object to them because they prefer to have a more decentralized economy, let's say. Or people may refer to their family traditions or to their religion rather than to science when they look for a solution. The other thing we've learned um, really is that there's not much point having loads of facts in your head uh, unless you enjoy having them there because if you need a particular fact then it's very easy uh, to look it up. Another interesting result and this bears on my field particularly science communication is that what people want to know about science isn't necessarily uh, the, the scientific facts themselves. People ask questions like how do I tell if an expert is well trained and qualified? Was the research ethical? Who paid for this research? Would scientists give different advice if another political party was in power? Do politicians do what scientists tell them? And do journalists exaggerate science stories? Now these are all questions about science, but they're questions about how science works and how science feeds into the other things uh, that we do in the world. So, if we want to look up facts, where do we do it? Well, we don't really go to encyclopedias very much these days, and um, nor do we refer to a single authoritative broadcaster. We tend to go to this thing, uh, the World Wide Web or the Internet. And here, information's flowing in all kinds of directions from many sources to many readers, and it's changing all the time. So rather than going to our set of encyclopedias, we find a place where um, the broadcasters are still there, and there are individuals still there, uh, and they are producing content as well as consuming it. And also pumping information around the internet are companies and uh, robots, and we find also out there experts and not only that we'll find the liars and the fraudsters too it's a very busy place everyone producing information consuming information and passing it on now an important theorist of all this is manuel castells a sociologist um, and he comments that we're in a situation now we don't have to look in the encyclopedia for our knowledge because knowledge is accessible everywhere all the time. And he also points out that we can all travel instantaneously to places of knowledge. So we don't have to go physically to places of knowledge. We don't have to go to New York to see the great museums there. And we don't have to go uh, to the University of Cambridge uh, to listen to a lecture because we are all already there. I mean, here today, in this moment, we are all at the University of Cambridge, although uh, I doubt many of us are physically there, uh, and I'm certainly not. Notice, though, that Castells points out, to do this, we do need uh, resources. And one thing the lockdown has highlighted for us in the UK is that there are a great many people who are not actually connected into this swirling network of knowledge. So here's a recent report from the BBC um, telling uh, the story of a primary school head teacher in South London. Now London, one of the richest cities in the world, but there he says, digital poverty is a significant problem. And in his school in South London, 24% of pupils are effectively offline unable to study from home. Another aspect to bear in mind, of course, is that the, our internet provision is a commercial, we have to pay for it. And um, in this newspaper report, the comment is that if people are choosing between paying for data and paying for food, um, then they're probably going to pay for food. So that's an important problem, and not just for some people at the moment, but for all of us um, as a, a society going forward. 
Castells likes to think about skills. He, says, he asks, what skills do we need in order to know? What skills can enable us uh, to know? And we've already mentioned you do need access to IT and to be able to pay for that. And you need the skills to use IT um, too. Now, computers were designed to handle numbers. And they also do words very well. Now, if you're watching this near a keyboard, have a look. It's covered in letters and numbers. And Castells reminds us that in order to use IT effectively, you do need to be numerate and literate. Now, things like numeracy and literacy, we, we kind of take for granted that they're dealt with at primary school. And if you haven't got the hang of it by then, it's a, it's a, bit, it's a bit embarrassing. And uh, we tend to feel a, a bit stuck. But, you know, life changes, demands change on us. Uh, maybe um, developing these skills is worth it now because of the access they give us uh, to the digital world. So it's never too late to brush up on the basics. Castell's next point is about self-programming skills. And I translate this as knowing how to learn. A program in a computer tells the computer how to do the job that it's supposed to be doing. So that might be how to search the internet or how to edit an image. Now, the programs that we need in ourselves give us the capacity to do different kinds of things in the world. And if we suddenly find we have to do new things in the world or different things in the world, then we need to reprogram. So being able to self-program knowing how to learn can make us ready for uh, new challenges and uh, whatever comes our way. And you know, you may have the experience that, that I'm having lately of, this, of it being quite difficult uh, to observe all of this social distancing and to remember all the procedures and to resist doing the kind of thing that one might have done, like shake someone's hand. We have to reprogram, uh, it's different now. Uh, we need new skills. And the network is very flexible. It does change all the time and new information might appear, uh, new people might come into our world. So there's a lot of reconfiguring to do. We've got to be flexible. And also there's some bad guys out there. So we do need also to be wary. And I'll put Castell's last three pieces of advice together. He says, what we need to survive all this is a sense of identity. Because everything's changing so fast and we're connected with so many other people, we need to know who we are. So a bit of uh, reflection on what makes us who we are um, can be really useful. Personal flexibility is another one. Okay, we may have learned some stuff 30 years ago. Uh, perhaps it's not so useful now. Maybe we need to uh, start again and learn something else. Maybe we're going to have a different kind of job after all this. Um, maybe we'll be mixing with different kinds of people as the world changes. We need to be flexible. And also with all this change going on and all this uh, new learning, uh, strong fundamental values uh, help us stand our ground. We need to know uh, how to decide what's good and what's bad in order that uh, we can take things forward. So this is Castell's list. This is what we need to know in the world at the moment. We need to have access to IT and the skills to use it. We need to be numerate and literate. We need to be able to self-program, so we need to learn how to learn. We need a sense of identity so that we can keep a hold of ourselves in all of this change. Uh, we need personal flexibility to respond to change and our strong fundamental values um, so that we can uh, go forward um, for the better. Now, back in the 18th century, knowledge was divided up like um, leaves on a tree or entries in an encyclopedia. But now information is swirling around in the network and it makes new combinations. So where you might have found, um, looking at the top left here, that 
there were people, some people using computers in one place and some people thinking about art in another place. Now you're going to find that people are thinking about the relationship between computers and art. And where you might have found at one point um, environmental campaigners uh, in one place and business people in another, now you're going to find green entrepreneurship bringing all those values together. And that's happening in a lot of areas um, that we study in universities and in a lot of uh, ways uh, in which the world um, is changing. It's all about combinations, interchange, um, and bringing things together uh, to make um, uh, new thinking. Now, one last word about self-programming, the learning how to learn. If we go back to this painting again, and um, if you recall, I was challenged to, to state its name uh, and, its, um, and its painter. And I did look it up and it is called the afternoon, the, uh, a Sunday afternoon on the Ile Grand Jatte. And it's by Seurat, Georges Seurat. So we know that now. But how we might ask as well, just apart from those facts, how, how can we look at that painting? Are there different ways to look at that painting? And if we look at it differently, might we see different things? So the skill of looking could be important there. We might want to ask um, how it was made and, and why. Um, it's actually two metres tall and three metres wide, which is quite surprising. So that lady on the right, she's roughly life size. We might want to ask, why do we, why do we value it? How do we ascribe value to something like that? And what does this painting and the way we treat it say about the world we live in? And if we can ask those kinds of questions of a painting like this, then we can ask those questions about paintings that have yet to be painted. And we might also be able to ask them of our statues and our buildings uh, and our institutions. And what about our new companion? There are scientific questions to be asked about this. What is it? How does it work? Um, but we can also ask, how do we go about tackling it? How do we choose our responses to something like this? Whose advice should we seek? And what kind of decisions would be informed by what kind of advice? We should also importantly ask, who's gaining from this situation? Because a lot of people are losing. And the reason why we should ask those questions is so that we can do better next time. So that's my answer to the question, um, what do we need to know? Uh, there's my contact details. I teach uh, science communication at the Institute. And if you want to have a look for science communication courses and other um, interdisciplinary and academic skills based courses, uh, then please do have a look at the website. Mm -hmm.